Hello class, let's look at transistors as a switch. This would be a third unit in the subject of fundamentals of electronics for mechanical engineering. As we did study about the basic structure of a transistor, we see the transistors are three-legged components. So you have the first pin is your emitter, your base, and your collector. This would be a typical transistor on a small device that you would see in electronics. But these days, transistors have become even more smaller. So I'd like to show you something in what a transistor would look like in these days. A transistor these days would be as small as the dot that you'd see on a circuit board. So you turn detail. It's the tip of the screwdriver. That black blob would be your transistor. So you have one leg on one side and two other legs on the other side. This would be your typical transistor in your modern day electronics. But Transistors also do come in various sizes when they handle much higher currents and much higher power. Let's look at our syllabus. So we're looking at the third unit, transistor as a switch. When we talk about the different sizes, you would see transistors that have plastic enclosures that have uh, three pins. So you'd have your emitter, base, and collector when you're considering looking at the transistor. On the looking at the flat side so on the flat side you'd have the model number the make and the manufacturer specifications of the transistor when you have higher currents and high powers to be dissipated you have transistors that have metal heat sink to have the heat dissipated to keep the transistor cool and not burn out when you have even higher powers for example in the case of having a 500 watt amplifier for an auditorium then you would have such transistors that have huge heat sinks, and these heat sinks are mostly on the side of your amplifier body, dissipating the power to keep the transistor cool during its operation. Now let's look at a typical, typical circuit and how a transistor is operated. Right in this case, the circuit of a wireless transmitter, as seen in our practical circuit. Let's go back to this circuit. This is a small wireless toy transmitter. You can you have your joystick for your throttle and your direction control. And this transmitter has a transistor which is a little higher powered so that you can dissipate power on your antenna. And this is where your antenna is connected. Let's look at the transistor in this case. This circuit is what I'm going to be showing you in a practical demonstration. When you look at the circuit, you see that the input signal is being dissipated by an antenna, most probably a small hookup wire or a loop antenna, that hookup wire that will be acting as an antenna to dissipate the power from your circuit so that your receiver can pick up a signal. So as we see, the transistor that we saw in the circuit earlier was 3904. This would be a typical application where the collector has the antenna hooked up to it. So this is a typical application, and the only component that is large and not an SMD component would be a transistor. The rest of them are small SMD components on the other side of the circuit board. So as we've seen in application, let's go and look at transistor in uh, what it would look like in a data sheet. When you talk about a transistor data sheet, you would need to look at what voltages it can operate at and how much current can it withstand. This transistor as a switch can handle about 600 milliamps DC. This transistor is a very common transistor, which is called the uh, 2222. So uh, this transistor is very common and is used in most electronics to switch AC loads when it's operated by a microcontroller. Let's, microcontroller. Let's look at a typical practical circuit board. What does it look like? This is your typical circuit board. So you have three terminals. Two would be for your power supply and one will be for your signal. So this would be output output terminal. So this would be your input terminal. So two for your power supply and one for your signal. So if you look closer, you would see that the, the first pin is your 12 volt power supply and the last pin, middle pin would be your ground. And the last pin would be your input for your transistor. And that input comes through your to the base of the transistor. So this would be a common emitter configuration. Let's look at that circuit in detail. So what happens is, your 12 volt power supply is always available at the transistor, but it doesn't turn on because it does not have the current flowing through the collector, which in this case, the load is connected to the collector. The moment you give an input to the input pin, which is the last pin on this row, the current goes through the base of the transistor, 
the collector current starts flowing through the transistor, that current flows through the coil of the relay, it turns on, and in this case you have your loads, you have normally open contacts and normally closed contacts, normally open contact would close and the normally closed contact would open. This is how you'd operate a heavy load like a, a light or a fan or a 230 volt operated load using a small transistor. Let's look at what the circuit looks like. <clears throat> this would be a typical circuit. So your control signal comes from your microcontroller or any other small embedded device that can give you a small signal, a logic on or off. When it's on, that input goes to the base, it triggers the transistor, the transistor turns on. How? Because you have your PNP, this in the case is an NPN transistor. The P and N junction would be reverse biased. The moment you give the base, it, the bias get, depletes the middle junction, which is the P junction, and the current starts flowing from the VCC, which is your power supply, to your ground, through your load, which is your relay coil. This diode is in reverse bias, I'll explain that in detail, and through your collector and through your emitter into the ground. This flowing of current because of the input through the base that causes the collector to flow is where you have a small current from your base, small voltage applied at your base, able to operate a large voltage which is operating your collector current. In this case, this large voltage would be about 12 volt driving your relay. This relay in, in turn would operate an electrically isolated there's no connection between the circuit and the next circuit. So this circuit would be operating on 230 volt and it would be drawing a current up to say 6 amps or 10 amps proportional to the quality of the relay and the specifications of the relay to operate a completely isolated load. Thus, I could use a relay, sorry, I can use a transistor as a switch. So, now why do I have to have a diode interverse bias? As we studied earlier, an inductor, a coil, can store current. The moment I turn the transistor off, make the logic low, the current shuts off. But the current that was stored in this inductor, inductance of this relay coil, cannot be destroyed. Energy can never be destroyed. This undesirable charge of, uh, I mean, the store of energy in the form of current will continue to flow in the same direction even after the power is interrupted. Such flow of current would continue to flow through the diode until it's dissipated. This diode would operate as a freewheeling diode, and so it's called a freewheel diode, and it's hence operated in reverse direction. So only comes into operation only when the power is interrupted or the transistor is turned off. The rest of the times, this diode will be in reverse bias and it will have negligible current flowing through it. So this is a typical application of a circuit where we see a transistor operating as a switch using a small voltage from your microcontroller to operate a large load, maybe AC or DC loads, using a relay electrically isolated. Thus, we see a practical application of a transistor as a switch. Let's have an overview of transistors. As I talked about the three pins, emitter, base, collector, one, two, and three. Let's go in detail. I talked about metal cap transistors. These transistors are similar to the plastic cap transistors. Only difference is that they can dissipate a little higher power, and this metal can be used as a heat sink to dissipate the heat into the air. There are two configurations, NPN and PNP, and this would be the symbol and how it's expressed in a transistor. So we did, saw, we, we did see a practical application of an NPN transistor as a switch. We will see it in much more detail. So manufacturers do manufacture transistors by the same manufacturer in two different configurations, NPN and PNP, how do you identify it? You can't see it to identify it. You need to look up the model number of the transistor, look it up online, and identify if it's an NPN or a PNP. So P and an N forms a diode. P and an N forms a diode. There are two diodes connected together in anti paddle. So let's look at a diode. In this case, a PN junction, and there's a barrier in between. And this barrier breaks down when it's biased in the forward direction. So I could have two diodes connected together, a P, N, and a P, and a P and an N. It's called anti-paddle. When I connect them together, I would get N, P, N transistor. Such an operation. But the truth is, this P layer is really thin and can be easily biased to be able to make this barrier deplete and the current flow from this N to this N from your emitter collector to your emitter, in the case of an NPN transistor, when it operates like a switch. This arrangement of using a transistor as a switch is very common and you will see it in most microcontrollers when they operate 
loads. For example, in the case of home automation, you would use transistors as a switch very frequently. Let's talk about other applications of transistors in the next session. If you feel if you have any questions, feel free to drop in a message in the group or ask questions to my email address. Thank you and have a great day.